Okay, hello, this is Um Sully with Um Sully Speaks. We have a very riveting conversation, a very emotional conversation about um, abuse, emotional and physical abuse that we cause as parents and how can we fix it and remedy those things. Um, we'll be talking with Rich Price. Um, he is a teen mentor and a family mentor. He does a lot of things. So, uh, further ado, let's, um, let's get talking. Let's, let's talk. Um, Sully speaks. Okay. We are live. So, hello everybody. Let me check if we see if you're live because I don't know if I'm live yet. This is Um Sully with Um Sully Speaks. Um, we are live with Rich Price again. Um, I am. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking about verbal abuse, raising kids with love. Um, Rich Price is going to be talking about. Um, how we can fix ourselves as parents because sometimes we don't know. I'm, I'm not perfect. That's why we're having these conversations here. That's why we're talking. Um, so Rich Price, please give us a quick background. I know you've been here a few times, but for those who are viewing the first time, would like to know um, a little bit more about you. Why should they be listening to you? Go on. Yeah, yeah. First of all, a happy new year to everyone. Every happy new year. Um, I, I think it's really important. Well, I'm, I can only speak for myself, but new year for me is uh, eclipse all the other holidays because it's an opportunity to look back um, and it's verification and proof that you actually were, were here. You survived the previous year. And Lord knows uh, 2020 was a, a dog of a year. So for all of us, all of those who have made it through 2020, um, happy new year and welcome to 2021. It's already started off fairly shaky, but what's more, what's really important is that as we transition into one year to the next, um, believe this, nothing will be any different if you're not prepared to uh, change your mind and develop new behaviors and attitudes that will unleash, unleash um, blessings and not only in your life, but also in your children's life. So yes, it's exciting to be able to say I made it out of 2020, but 2021 won't be any different if you're not prepared to make an internal change that could affect an external change. So happy new year to everyone. My name is Rich Price and my area of expertise is leadership training and personal development. Um, I had an opportunity last night and we talked about uh, my youth leadership group uh, purpose. I, I think I was asking the kids, um, do you understand what your purpose is or what is purpose? And eloquently, uh, uh, the car is one of her sons. I think it was Yusuf. I think it was Sal. He did a great job of just talking about what you were designed or meant to do. Uh, and, and see, at the end of the day, as parents, as, as coaches and leaders and people of influence, all we want is for our, our children, people that we love, to find their purpose, their call in their life. Man, if, if we can get them to uh, discover that early, my goodness, half of our problems half of their problems will be alleviated because when you know what your purpose is, it's like, it really is like, I got, I mentioned this before. It's like dating yourself, falling in love with something about you that you just really, really enjoy. Anybody out there that's ever dated in has been in a relationship. The most exciting part of the relationship is what you don't know about that person. This is intoxicating, but it's important to um, constantly peel the layers back and find out a little bit more about that person. And now it's more important than ever to find out a little bit more about you. You. It's so important. You need to be finding out more about you every opportunity that you get. Because let's be real, we live in a, we live in an absolute, living in absolute crazy times. And everybody's uh most people are so consumed with uh, political parties and you know hatred and fitting in this fit fitting in this group, that group. Uh, I say, listen, parents, uh, that's a distraction. It's a distraction and it's nonsense. At this particular point, you need to, num number one, keep working on yourself and uh, start to provide your children with the tools and the skills that they need so they can navigate through this thing called life. 
a lot of people say, oh, things are not fair. It's not fair if you're not prepared for it, if you haven't trained yourself for it, if you haven't, if you haven't learned how to overcome and go through adversity, of course it's not fair because you're not used to that stuff. But the earlier, the better. The earlier, the better. So I'm sorry, I got off on a diet trial. But yeah, uh, my focus really is just, um, uh, my focus is really um, helping young people, helping everyone, but especially young people uh, take a peek into the future so they can start seeing something with their name on it, be excited about their future and know that whatever they want to do, they can do it if they believe in it. And that's the challenge, if they believe in it. So again, uh, thank you for the platform. Thank you for an opportunity to um, uh, get this message out. And, and what we're going to be focusing on, um, I guess, this afternoon is uh, abuse. And abuse comes in a lot of different forms, whether that's verbal or physical abuse. Um, and sometimes the verbal abuse is uh, much more devastating than physical abuse because it's ingrained it's ingrained in our uh, in us continuing to grow up as uh, young men and women. And those words do hurt. They're very, very powerful. They're cutting. There's not a, there's not a moment where, you know, I don't think about some of the harsh things that were uh, said to me, whether that's just through friends or family members. And I can recall, I could be in a, uh, a situation and I can go back to, you know, 89. I can still feel that emotional pain. That's because because words do hurt. Words are very powerful. So don't believe that nonsense that words don't hurt. Because mm -hmm. words can edify you, but it can also destroy you. That's why, that's why it's mentioned in, in, in the Bible and the Quran, you know, that our tongue, how powerful our tongue is. Why do you think there's the dictators are so important? Because their tongues and, and the what they use fear tactics to, you know, deter people. Our, our words are very, very powerful. So as we continue to learn how to be parents, whether that's good or bad, because who's going to, who are anyone to say that we're good or bad parents? Because that's, that's just really being judgmental. But as we continue to be parents, we have to understand that we have the power to really, really edify and build our children up. We, we oftentimes uh, do the opposite through frustration because Sometimes uh, what we want for our children, children, they're not doing those things. And it's frustrating because Lord knows we've only told them a thousand times. Right. <laughs> and uh, I think we start to spew on them, you know, our disappointment and disapproval. Um, and, and we don't obviously we don't do it to crush them, but it happens. It comes out. So, yeah, that's that's it. Let, let's go ahead and. Um, Let's go ahead and put some structure to our call, because if not, I'll just be talking. So what did, what did like, do you have like specific questions? Or you Sorry about that. So my uh, daughter's teacher just called and I was like, what? Huh? So, <laughs> um, so you started off dropping, dropping some knowledge that a lot of people aren't ready to hear. And um, <clears throat> just to let that sink in, about verbal abuse and how it affects people and affect adult, adults to this day. Um, you know, first, first thing I want to mention that you are, you know, your background is in, um, you work, work at a high school, you um, mentor kids, you mentor teenagers, especially through a lot of turbulence times. So you have a lot of experience in dealing with the re repercussions of uh, parents and their, um, their tend to verbal abuse and you see the, the outcome of them not necessarily being supportive of their children. Yeah. Um, I know my personal experience with verbal abuse is, um, it's just, it affected my entire life. Like, you know, how I was talking by media parent, um, how, you know, it was just one teacher that I will never ever forget. And she, she changed the course of my entire education um, because I was having trouble reading. And I mentioned in several videos that I have a reading disability. And instead of evaluating the reading disability, she made it worse. And she made it worse and, and made me feel stupid. And from that time forward, I have a, I guess a phobia or it's hard for me to learn from people because of the verbal abuse that I was given. And You'd be surprised it was in a Muslim school. So it was a Muslim school. It was a Muslim teacher. 
she made me feel like I was nothing. She compared me to other kids. And till this day, I still sometimes have like flashbacks on how she affected me educationally. Instead of just at the beginning, seeing that I had a disability or, or evaluating it, she, she destroyed in a way the, the person that was growing inside. So when you're talking about verbal abuse and how we deal with children, whether it is your child or whether it's someone else's children that you have authority over, I think we have to, we have to notice these things. So tell me why you feel so strongly. We, we can talk about the picture that's in your background for one. Um, Cause when, I, when, you first, when we came, first came on, I, I was like this, you know, it's a powerful picture. You see black mom pointing at her kid saying this, that, and the other, you can conclude so many things, but the boy, yeah. he just looks like it's so many things are going to go wrong. Yeah. Well, let, we can, yeah, let's, let's draw an assumption from the picture in the background, but before we do that, let's talk about exactly what you went through. Cause um, this, is, this is extremely important because I felt the same way. Um, so thinking of thinking about this, a lot of times people don't really know what abuse is. You know, they say abuse, they, oh, I, they think it's physical abuse. I, I'm not abusing. Um, but any time that you say anything that uh, can crush someone's spirit, um, I guess that would be considered verbal abuse. And I think about how respond. I think about how irresponsible we all are sometimes with the words that come out of our, our mouth. You know, I, I actually, when I think about that right now, I guess I'm guilty of some verbal abuse even to this very day. I mean, you know, it's funny because you're absolutely right. I see it in the school system all the time. But I got, you know, a responsibility to care for five children here, and there's times where you know. I'm trying to challenge them or I'm actually frustrated and I might say something to them. I might say something. It's not meant to be harsh or malice, but I think about that. And I, was mm. like, wow. I, can't, I can't even take that back now. So uh, as we were talking about it and I'm thinking about what you just shared about that teacher, how she made you feel, it just brought back uh, memories for me because um, I always felt like uh, I always felt insecure, you know, as a young kid, um, and that was just from my own, my own, you know, family, you know, my own. I guess the competition in the family when it came to reading, writing, academics. I was usually the one kind of, you know, far back and behind because I, I just didn't do well. But I, I didn't realize it was a real problem until um, I got in school and. Um, the, the teachers that you have, that job is so important, especially, you know, elementary, middle school, because, you know, there's some internal struggles and battles that you have. Because oftentimes they don't really realize what's going on in your home life. The good ones do. The, the really committed ones do. But for the most part, these are also still people who have faults, who, you know, it's a job. Some a lot of them, it's a job. Um, a lot of them is profession, um, and that's the difference. Those who choose who see it as a job and those who see it as a profession. And sometimes early in those, the career of a teacher, it is a, it's a job until it becomes a profession, and there's a lot of damage that can be done. And I remember being um, one of the things back in the 90s, <clears throat> 80s and late 80s and 90s is, you know, <clears throat> you would have an opportunity. You had to, like, speak and read in groups, and you know, I had a speech impediment. I was very, very uh, nervous to speak in groups. And I remember, I can't remember the teacher would always force me to um, speak in groups. And But little did she know that, I don't think it was the fact that I couldn't read very well. It was the fact that I had always been compared to other kids who had a higher reading ability than mine. So I started to, I started to just feel like, well, I don't fit in. Um, and it's opposed to finding ways to motivate me to, to move ahead and, you know, do it anyway, because at the end of the day, you know, we all got fears and we got to find a way to just walk in our fears, but it takes a real skilled professional to identify and realize that, you know, yes, 
there's some limitations or here, but, you know, let me find a way to motivate and help that person to move on in, in spite and despite of that. Uh, and when you don't have true professionals who can detect that, what they do is they project their frustration and exhaustion on you and it lasts forever. Like this was, this was kindergarten, first grade. And I remember being put in a, it was like ABC reading readers. And then it was rich and three other people. <laughs> and and uh, it just didn't make, cause back then it was okay to put labels on everybody. I mean, they still put labels now, but in school, it was okay to put labels on everybody. And I remember just having that label, uh, you know, being in the very lowest reading room. And it was not a lot of, and the help, all the help that came <clears throat> at that time came from the kids that were A readers. Now just imagine a kid who's an A reader trying to help another kid who's a D reader. Um, yeah, let's just be real. Uh, yes, peer stuff, but they don't have a lot of grace for you. Mm. They're not saying, oh, keep going. Hey, no, you missed that word. It, 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 it just, it's just, I remember. I remember exactly how you felt. Um, but it, it's, it's funny because it, it lasts a lifetime. It lasts a lifetime. And it's not, all, it's not raging every day, but it's just certain times. Because I, I, I have that same anxiety sometimes. Um, and it's funny because oftentimes I have to read with the kids, you know, in the training sessions, even with my own kids. Or sometimes when I'll get invited to the school and sit and read books to kids, like I have to, I have to train my mind that, okay, because that, that negative voice is coming saying, uh-oh. And I'm like, I'm over that. Like, I got so much, I got so, so much stuff that I can just say, you know, I, I beat that part of my life. But it is in the back of my mind, constantly hearing that teacher or hearing people, you know, uh, doubt my ability to effectively read or so it, it is it is true but one of the things I think one of the things and I have to be more mindful this is why these types of conversations are good the worst thing that you can do um, with your children is compare them to other children because all our, all our children are great in in their own little special way and I remember just being compared to my my cousins like, I, my cousins were really smart like they were AB students they were uh, but I remember constantly being compared to those guys. And after a while, you know, not, so just imagine a kid thinking like, OK, why am I not special? What do they have that I don't have? Because adults, we do the same thing. <laughs> we internalize and we won't necessarily, you know, you know, you know, crowd, you know, like most kids. But what happens is young people start thinking like there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and we got to be careful. We got to be careful when we start comparing children to other children because we all got talent, skills, and abilities. We all got different growth. We all grow and mature at different times. And I think, and, I, and obviously, I'm 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 not saying anything about against educators because my wife is an educator. I work in school systems. I've worked in heck college universities pretty much all my adult life. But I do know there's a lot of power in those positions. And if we don't, if they don't treat them right, it can impact somebody for a lifetime. That's why, that's why I kind of felt like I'm over, I overcompensated. I overcompensated with school. You know, okay, I, I, I kept going because I felt like, okay, I got like two master's degrees, uh, a bachelor's degree, two associate's degrees. What was the, the, yes, I was learning. I was, you know, becoming educated, but for me, I wanted to bury that feeling mm. of yesteryear. And I just kept going because no matter how much schooling I was getting, I never felt like I kept hearing the voice. I kept having those feelings. And I wanted to just say, you know what? No one, no one could, would ever be able to say that I'm not smart enough anymore. Just to realize that, yeah, that type of education, formal education is important, but what I'm really, what I was really searching for had nothing to do with formal education. I was searching for a knowledge of self. Yeah, self-acceptance. Yeah, well, guess what the Bible and the Quran teaches? <laughs> knowledge of self. So. That's, that's why it's extremely important as parents. Knowledge of self, the sooner the better. You need to start teaching your ch children about who they are you know, about our, our creator. All that stuff is so important. So when they when you do put them in those school systems, 
they can't they can't read. And I say this in the most I don't want to say brainwashed because that's not what well, that's not what I mean. But the formal education on top of the personal education, you don't want that formal education to dominate the personal education or personal development. Because what happens is you have you have an, what you have is, as a result, you have people who are just simply book smart. Mm -hmm. They have no clue of who they are. And what you have is you have a generation who was. Um, you know, spent their entire lives in the formal education and they're into colleges and universities and all they are is smart. No, it's all, they're just smart. And we you know, unfortunately, guess what we see with these people in political office? A lot of brilliant people yeah. in political office. Morally, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them, morally corrupt. They don't know who they are. They won't even stand up for things that internally that just kills them because they want to protect their position and title. Yeah. That's, a, that's a direct reflection of people who have allowed, uh, they have been trained so much formally where self-development and knowing who they are takes a second stand to their personal development. And we see that. And I, this is one of the challenges that I have with some of my own kids. We got some really smart kids in, my, in this house. Um, and, you know, they are, we do acknowledge that. But one of the things, even when I go to the parent teacher conference, you know, oh, this, he's so smart, he's this and that. And then we got a few other kids who struggle academically and they want to throw them into like special classes or say, well, he might need some medication. I said, let me stop right there. At this particular point in their life, I think it's important for them to develop academically. I say, but at this particular point, I'm not concerned about that stuff. I'm concerned about the type of person they're becoming. It's more important right now that they become a good human being and know how to treat people rather than you telling me that he's, okay, he's reading at a decimal level. He's two steps behind. I'm not worried about all that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to step in as parents because we want to respect the teachers because they, that's their profession. But when we have young children and they're already placing them and giving them labels and telling them what they're not early, that's the first sign of the abuse, really. Because at some point, we, we accept the opinion from the teachers and we start believing it. And then we start treating our children like that. That's what we need to step in and say, you know what? That's, I, you know, I, I appreciate your input, but that's not as important as me to, trying to develop a good human being. Yeah, doesn't have not figured out how to do this division of multiplication yet. It's not reading at a speed level, but um, that's okay. Because right now, I want to develop his or her personality. I want him to treat people with love. That's, that's the first sign. That's what we need to be doing as parents to, to rule out this, this, uh, this verbal abuse. Um, but yeah, let's take, a, let's, take a, let's take a stab at this picture behind because this picture says a lot. We, we have, and if you look at it, you can draw your own assumption. But I, I, I use this because this is a mom this is a mom. I saw this as a mom <laughs> saying, you know, just you can just see her expression. She's frustrated the point. And, and right here, look at the difference in positions. And after positions, she's standing up. The kid is sitting down. Well, that's already it's an inferior position to be in. Look at the anger and frustration on her body. And I'm just like, when are you going to grow up? I mean, think about how many times we ask our children that. When are you going to grow up? You're freaking eight, nine, 15, 16, well, however old they are. But here's the reality. We don't do anything to help them grow up because we, we're challenging them. Or we're asking them when they're going to grow up, but we still treat them as if they were in an incubation stage. And that's a very confusing message. It is a very so, confusing message, but how, how do you suggest parents talk to their kids then? Because... <clears throat> when I get frustrated with my kids, I tend to yell. I tend to oh, say, I'm a yeller. Because they, they test you. They, they test you. So are you going to be a pushover? Or are you going to be their mom? Like, you better, you better not stop playing with me. So how do you know if you're going too far with verbal, with the, with, and becomes verbal abuse? Um, I think you don't, you, ever, you don't really ever know until you uh, see how much destruction you've done. Because it's real in the moment, in the moment, in the moment. 
know, we are, we're really kind of, kind of uh, the expectation for our children is so high. Sometimes the expectation is higher than even their capabilities, right? And it's like, we've had that conversation over and over again. Like we visit, we, we were visiting the same thing over and over again. And that's frustrating. Come on, seriously, that's frustrating. And it, and our kid, we know our kids so well, or we think we know our kids so well, and it can just be one thing and we explode on. We explode on, but we really never know the damage until we see the, the destruction, number one, and their response, mm-hmm. their body language. Because some kids cry easy, right? So we're used to that, but we can really see when we really went too far. I know I can, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I How do you get back from it? You I'm going to share something that I did. This doesn't really paint the brightest picture, but I want to say, yeah, it was last year, 2020, the middle of 2020. Uh, my oldest son, um, I guess I assume he's just going to step up and be a great leader for other four or five kids, you know, and um, he doesn't. Uh, he'll, he'll do it if you tell him to do it, but you have to tell him exactly what to do and how to do it. And I, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm like, you're 19, you know, so I just started to go at him and I'm like, you got five, you know, four other kids who are looking up to you. Yes, you probably don't want to be a leader, but, you know, you know, the fact that, you know, by your age, you need to demonstrate that. And, and um, I can tell he just, just dad talking again. He didn't really want to hear it. You know, it's, to me, I, his body language is just like, go stick your head in the toilet. You know, he didn't say that, but that's how I felt. So I picked up on that energy and that just sent me into a rage, you know, because in, in, in my house, um, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. But one thing that I don't necessarily tolerate is um, my children, our children um, challenging our authority. That's important. That's important. Uh, is- yeah, it is important. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to necessarily run the house like a side dictatorship. Note. Yeah, no, no, no. Side note, it's not a dictatorship because if they don't fear your authority or or, or uh, respect your authority, then exactly. that's when the cops come out. That's and when they come. That's yeah. when black men get attacked, and and moms, you know, black moms don't realize that because they're not afraid or they don't respect authority. Yeah, they're going to. They're going to get shot. They're going to get attacked because yeah. we, don't, we don't have that sternness at home. That's right. And, and, and the thing about it is uh, a lot of police officers and people who have authority, they don't they won't have the same grace that you have for your children because they have a, they know they have a dangerous job. You know, yep. uh, so they're not they're not trying to give our children the benefit of the doubt whatsoever. So at, to get back to that, you know, to me, I felt, I felt like he was challenging my authority. because Number one, he wasn't looking at me. His body language was just saying, I don't really want to hear it. And to me, that's just totally unacceptable because I already know. And because, you know, dude, you, you, you've been a solid kid for 18 years. So for you not to look at me and pay attention to what I'm saying and, you know, respond when I ask you a question, that means that you're disengaged. You're not interested in what I got to say. That's not good about this house. OK. And I remember I can't I can't remember exactly what I said, but I know it was it was bullhornish. It was like strong. And I meant it and I was ready to back it up. Mm-hmm. And I and I remember him going out to his car and he didn't, you know, stopped it for like maybe five minutes. Like, what, is, what is this guy? At? So I go out there to even confront him even more. And I'm just and I'm and I but it was dark, you know, it was we were on our driveway and I realized he was sitting in the car crying. Wow. That's a, that's a, that's a, a hurt piece as a parent, because our, our job is to protect, provide and maintain job is to protect, provide and maintain. And well, I think about when you did what you did, you still against yourself. It still hurts me as a father. That's when you know you went too far. Yeah. That was six months ago. You about to make me cry. <laughs> um, it should because, but how did you guys heal from that? How did you guys heal from? Is it is it still something that he? No, it's not. It's not. But you know, when you ask that question, 
when you can crush when you can crush somebody that bad, you know you went too far. Yeah. And um, that was a moment for me to like take a step back and realize that I don't have to be that. You know, if I'm feeling that frustrated, I gotta, I gotta have some type of resolve and with myself to know that now is not the time to, you know, that's not the time. And thank God I went out there and I, I recognized, you know, how, you know, what I did. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment where I surrendered, I guess, my uh, parental authority over. You know, I really did. I asked for forgiveness because that was, I was, it wasn't really about being wrong, mm-hmm. but it was about that relationship was more important than me. Do you feel like it is forever broken or do you feel like? No, no, it, it, I, we squashed it that night. Uh, he's, yeah. saying, he's saying how well contrite I was because it was real, it was emotional. And I'm like, man, I went too far. Like, I got my message across, but I went way too far because if I can make, you know him a 19 year old feel like that mm. and it was it's all through love you know because those other four kids are watching but if i can make him feel like that to go out in the car and cry like that's that's too much yeah that's too I'm much you recognize that you know there's yeah I, yeah normally i would have just been like it is what it is you know and i think that was pro- i think that was probably one of the most dynamic um points in our relationship because it was it was it was man to man but it was father to son and I was surrendering over my title as a father at that moment that moment to say you know what you know what I'm really sorry that I I will you forgive me that you know that was that was BS that yeah. was BS and I can be better than that. And so we talk he talked right then and there and I just let him know how how proud I am of him and I, and I this is the one thing we got to realize is what we expect, you know, sometimes we don't verbalize what we expect out of our children. We just assume that they know. Just because he's 19 don't mean he's, he's a good, good leader for the other five poor kids. That's, yeah, he's he's 10 years older than the next guy. Just because he's 19, 20 years old don't mean that they are leaders, that they can, they can actually, they have the capabilities to fulfill the role as a leader. They have to grow. They have to grow into that role. And I think that's what happens is we expect, hey, dude, you're the oldest. But what if they don't know how to be a leader? And really, oftentimes they don't know how to be a leader because we never set the right example. Because mm. they see mom and daddy, you know, sometimes they catch us arguing or, you know, not selling our differences. They don't know how to be leaders. So everything is really a result of us, you know. And I think as parents, we got to realize that we got to not be mom and dad and be the the person is going to say, ah, oh, we got to ask that that's, that's maturity for parents. And I'm happy that happened for me because that, that really, that really broke me down to the point where I realized that, man, remember your words are powerful and your relationship, your relationship with your children is more important than rules. Mm. It is. It's, I can't remember the book, but it's a, one of the books that I'm reading said is um, relationship before rules. And that's with your children, with other people. If you, if you don't know other people, if you don't know other people, if you don't know what motivate them, you don't know their scars, you know, especially people who work in the workforce. If you don't know that stuff, yes, there's a there's a corporate line, but you have you have to understand that you can't smash them, you can't have your DNA all over them and beat them up with rules when you don't have a relationship with them. Because they'll do it, they'll they'll follow through and do the job because they're gonna get paid. Yeah. But we don't want that. You want to have a relationship with someone, so when things are difficult, you know they're gonna give you the, your very best anyway. Because now you have the right relationship with them. But I think in corporate America and sometimes even at home, because we are the parents, we forget that more important than rules are relationships. If you got the right relationship with your son or daughter, they will cooperate with you. Yeah, I can attest to that because the kind of parents we are is we're viewed is is, is crazy how we're viewed in, t- in two different ways. Um, by my family, we're viewed to be extreme parents, and um, 
we're super Muslim, you know, we don't let them out, we don't do this. But then some people are in our community, they, they think we let them do whatever, you know. So, but we know we're in the middle and we talk to our kids, we give them examples. We tell them, I don't, you know, I, like I said, I don't tell them every little detail, but I express to them and I let them know this is, this could be your life. This is your choice. Yeah. We talk about making good established choices every day. You know, we talk about, okay, you, we don't encourage fornication. We don't encourage boyfriends. We don't encourage none of this, but we give them examples. Why we yeah. tell them you can have a relationship with your wife and you can have a beautiful marriage or you can have a string of girlfriends, possible baby mom, you have, um, you know, family members who, who gone down that rabbit hole, um, who, who may or may not, not know who their baby mom is and all this other stuff. Do you, do you want to live that way? We let them know you, you want to, you want to sell drugs? Guess what? You know how other people put money on books. We leaving you right there in jail. You better call your, your, your other family members who want baby you. But if you do that, after we put all this work into you and you want to make that decision, Hello. Guess what, Boo Boo Kitty? You're going to be in that jail cell by yourself because you're an idiot. And we tell yeah, them that. That's really that, important, too. To show them, to show them and give them an example. Because remember, we, they be, they're so used to us telling them everything. But when you show them, you know, and, and like you can have it this way, but we can do it this way. And it's, it is, it's a choice. It's a choice. And, and I, that's really good because kids, they, they're they're uh, they're visual learners. They're oh, visual yeah. learners. They are visual learners. All you got to do is show them, because it's, it's, it's killing me with this whole the black vi- victimization thing. We are not teaching our black boys how to be men. We are not teaching them how to be men. We are just expecting them to be men, and then when they're not doing it, we we screaming and yelling, "You ain't nothing. You ain't S H I T. You ain't nothing." And if, if we would have started from the beginning, talking to them, I talked to my kids ever since they was like seven or eight about marriage, about, about how to treat women. We didn't have to, we, we, me and my husband showed them how a proper relationship is. You know, we hold hands, he buys me flowers. This is how you treat a woman. We don't have to necessarily verbally say all of this because like you said, kids are, are visual learners. Yeah. If we take our time, and have an established family, we can we can cur- fix all of these problems we have in our community. Yeah. If we understand that a father is one of the most important things a child, not a boy, not a girl, a child can have mm-hmm. besides the mom, we can fix the broken home. We can fix the broken homes. Yeah. There is a cure to every disease, and we don't. But our community doesn't want to take these cures because it's too simple. Stop having babies out of wedlock, finish school, do this, do that. Before you start making these decisions, we don't teach our children to make good decisions. And then when they make horrible decisions, it's like, oh, it's too late. Yeah, it's devastating. You're absolutely right. Um, and it, and it, sounds, it sounds really simple, but, you know, like sound like a Nike commercial. Just do just it. Do it. But what, we, what we're saying is, you know, before you just do it, let's think about just do it. You know, whether that be, you know, completing your education, whether that be, you know, really taking the time to get to know someone before you intertwine your soul with them. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I come up in an environment like that where, you know, promiscuity was, hey, my goodness, that, no one taught you that, but you've seen it. Like that's like you've seen it. like that's what you're teaching when you're not standing up against something like that. And it's 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 I think the most dangerous thing is with the most dangerous thing as parents is not to stand for something that you know that can bankrupt your children. Like little little did I know that dating and kind of experimenting with you know girls on different levels like yeah for my flesh that was awesome but but richard you were encouraged from yeah, that was, hey, yeah exactly the little things the little things like 
oh, you won't get you a little girlfriend because you girl, you can be a boy, you can be a heartbreaker. Those little things. Yeah. You heard women say this to other to little boys. Oh, he's he cute. He won't be a heartbreaker. What do you mean he won't be a heartbreaker? So you you're you're encouraging him to 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 be mean to women to not appreciate women, which is abusive, really. And when you really think about it, you don't think about no level. Say those things. It's very abusive because it's not. And remember, I grew up in a, a patrilineal family, mostly all women. My mom and her sisters, and yeah, my father was there. I he pretty much demonstrated what not to do with everything in life. But where did I spend most of my time? With my mom and my sister, her, all her sisters. So the stuff that the stuff that I seen, even in the projects, because there was a lot of dysfunction between men and women. For me, for me, that was a reference point. Like, oh, it's like, but is this? It, it's. I guess the only thing I can really say about this is, listen, we so teachers get six to what seven hours a time with our children, maybe, but. And they can do everything right, but they got to remember, they got to come home. That means that there's probably another, if my math is right, 14 or 20 hours. So they can do everything right. You can have your child in the best situation, counseling, whatever. But if they're all their dysfunction and pain is at home, when they leave that place, they got to come home. It's all being undone. Whether that's, whether that's uh, consciously or, up, or subconsciously, it's all being undone. I thought and school was my safe place. Say it again. School was my safe place. When I was in high school, That's there good. was so much turmoil in my entire life. And when I found school, I entered in every single after school program awesome. that, that I could possibly do. I was in gymnastics. I was in badminton. I needed something. Yeah. Something to make sure I was in school as long as possible because of the constant turmoil that was going on in my life. Isn't that I, went to, I went to Penn State just to get my intentions were, were, yeah, I wanted to go to college, but I had to get away. Yeah. And I didn't do well, but it was so that I can get away. Just get away. Out of desperation. Yeah. Because of the turmoil that was in my household. And it was honestly, my my mother and father were raising grown behind kids. So I, with the verbal abuse is like the grown kids that had kids already were still getting so much help mm. from my mom and dad. I felt like the four, the last four that needed to be raised were like, it was crickets. Yeah. So then they start making their decisions and I'm like, oh, where's everybody at? And then everybody else's decisions affected me. So I use school as my safe place. Yeah. No, I, I don't just, remember. Just imagine that. The, the kids that I, a lot of the kids that I were. They're during COVID. That's because yeah. of COVID. Their That's safe place a, is gone. A, and, they, and I'll hear them. I'll hear them tell me being home is not the best thing for me, Mr. Price. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't really understand. As, as jacked up as my, you know, my youth was, I was safe at home, you know. I was, but these kids, when they tell me being at home is not the best place for me, like that's hard for me. Like I have to really marinate in what they're saying because, yeah. but my goodness, the safest place should be home. No, I had a verbally abusive older brother who made sure every single time he seen me, he made sure he called me ugly. He made sure me, he made sure that he, that I felt like trash. Like it was a point in time that I thought I was so ugly that I would never look in the mirror. If I got on a trolley, I would look down. I thought, when I say I thought I was a monster in my mind, I thought I was a monster. I, it. I thought I was horrendous, but this has nothing to do with wearing the comp. But it was like a point in my time, a point in time in my life when I was a teenager that I thought I was ugly. The first person, and my mother was one of the mothers who didn't believe in calling their children beautiful, you know, calling their girls beautiful because you have so many other things, you know, about you. You're so smart. You're so this, you're so that. And then I had a brother who was like, you know, ugly, ugly, ugly. And then the first person to call me that said I was beautiful was when I was in 
12th grade. And I know this sounds horrible. Um, and it was my nephew. And he, he went on a problem with me. And it was the first time anybody called me beautiful. And, and not to say I didn't get attention because I have, I have really good features. You know, I'm a medic, like, and I'm not trying to describe myself, but at the same time, it took me, when he did that, I was like, well, maybe I am. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sub. That's sub. That's subliminal. It, that voice. That voice. Those experiences. They never go away. We can be as we continue to improve ourselves. Those things are constantly fighting, trying to pull us back. Say, remember, remember. That's how the enemy works. He wants to. He wants to distract you. He wants to destroy your belief in yourself. And when you have other people. You know, contributing to that, um, especially if there's family members or friends, that's when it's devastating. But yeah, um, I, I, I love that. So that picture behind it, you can draw your own assumption. And it's, it's just the word pictures. It's a lot of pictures are powerful. And how can, um, we, how can we how can we we all we all get to the point of no return with our kids because they test us to the point you want to be like, yo, I'm about to go off. With the boxing gloves on, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> if, if we get to that point, because I've I've gone to that point. If oh, yeah. we get to that point, how can we bring it back? How can we fix it? How can we heal our kids from the abuse that we unintentionally cause out of love? We love yeah. them that much that we see. I think we see them. We see their their future so clear, and we don't realize they don't see it. No, they so don't. It's like, <laughs> They don't. They don't. I think. <clears throat> I think when we're like you know when I even when I was in that situation with my son, I think we have to just understand. You you gotta pull away for a minute. You gotta find a minute to really think and recognize where you are in that moment. I think the one thing that I'm still working on is be, and and most people most people whether it's extended family members, friends, or even stuff at work, no one. No one can get underneath my skin like my family, mm. my, my children or my, or my wife. Because I think it's so personal. It's so personal. And um, I think about that because I think sometimes we have disagreements and you know, why were you so far? Why you, you know, talk that way? Or it's like, I'm not really yelling. I'm just hated. I'm just, I'm just really like, like this is something I believe in. And I know it sounds like I might be yelling or screaming, but I, I'm not really screaming or yelling, but that has my attention. Like I'm like I'm on a heightened level when it comes to my wife or my children. And if something and if something doesn't go right, it's like that's that's it. But outside that, no one gets no one makes me angry. No one gets me to the point where like I'm crazy like that because I know my sanity, my sanity level with other people. We we don't we just don't have the type of relationship where I'm gonna allow you to go there with me. So I would say is a wall. We got to really, we got to really, really be conscious of the people. If we talk about our children, when we go there, we have to be really conscious of the moment that that moment that we're in with them. And you have to understand: is it worth it? Is it worth it to sever that relationship? Because there's there's some there's certain things that you you can't come back from. Mm. You know, and if it's that bad. It's going to take a long time to repair that relationship. So as a parent, it's all on us. Am I, am, I, am I really willing to go that far where I sever the communication relationship with my child? And if you can recognize that, then you'll, you'll do the right thing. But I think sometimes we're in that moment where, <laughs> I want to say rage, rage, but we're in that moment where we're really trying to hammer a point down and we don't realize that we're dangerously, dangerously at the point of, ruining that relationship with that kid. And I think it's on us at that point because we're the adult. We have to understand that they don't think like we think. They don't even get something as simple to us and we're trying to explain it to them. Even if it's been 10 times, they don't get it. They're not getting it just to be a goofball and just to you know tick you off. They just don't get it. They don't think like us. And I don't think we take the time to realize that. So we got to take more responsibility and understand that if our relationships with our children aren't where they need to be, it's probably because it's us. We have not, we have not taken the time to take inventory of 
number one, the relationship that I have with this child as opposed to, and you got, you got five kids, you know how it is. You got to have different relationships with them all. You know, and you can't really treat them all the same. You've got to love them the same, but you can't treat them the same. I feel like you know? I get the oldest one. I give, the, I have to, Ibrahim is, is sensitive, so I have to be very sensitive to him. Yes. So, Masood, he is, he's business driven. He's about his money. So I got to talk to him. I got to come to him. When Great I come point. to him, I got to be like, I got to have, you know, he about to, and the way Sully, he's analytical. He's, he's, he's going to analyze what you say. He's going to break it down. You yep. see about that fun. Sophia is a whole different ball game. She's a bundle of of rainbow and sprinkles and like if you can just put rainbow sprinkle and milkshakes and everything, girl, yep. one thing that's Sophia. Yeah. So you have to have the more kids, the more minds you have. So you have yeah. I have five five or six different minds for that's every right. kid, and it's mind bottling, and you have to take that. <clears throat> take that opportunity to break down the personality. That's I mean, right. my kids take personality tests. So like, so I can help them help, help me help them. So it was like a personality test. It was like, I realized I'm an INFJ. I am yeah. an advocate. I'm a leader. Solly was something else. Yusuf was something else. Ibrahim was something else. But when I took that personality <laughs> test, it broke down things about their personality. I was like, okay, that's what he was doing that for. Mm-hmm. So it was it was something that I did to help me help them. So when I took my life, what kind of parent yeah. I am? I'm a parent that sees long term. I'm I they I'm gonna have a better relationship with my kids when they get older, um, as opposed to now. <laughs> um, even though yeah. we have an awesome yeah. relationship, I can I'm not a, a, a I'm not a coddler. I'm not gonna sit there and be like, oh my god, this is my I'm not a Listen, I can't wait till you get 21. Then we're going to be best friends. <laughs> I want to see the, the, I prepare for the future. So I want to see them when they're mm-hmm. older. Cause I'm not going to be like, oh, well, I don't ever want you to grow up. No, I want you to grow up. I want you to get out of my house. Cause this is, this is, mm-hmm. this is where you want to put the work in. So yeah. I, just, I just think that, and plus, and, and then, uh, you know, I know that you're a foster parent. Does it, does it matter if, if, if it's birth or not, because I know that I have stepkids, they're my kids. They're my kids. Yeah. Well, you don't see, you don't know. You don't know until you don't know. You don't know until you know. And I know that's a, might be a confusing statement, but prior to becoming, even prior to, be, you know, going into a uh, blended family, um, you think to yourself, well, these are my kids and this is her kids. And then, you know, then you want to go into do the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, adoption or whatever. <clears throat> One thing that you realize is that the moment, the moment that you accept your husband or your wife and they have children, mm-hmm. it's not any it has it has no it's no longer about these are my kids and these are your kids. Like I don't care. You know, and and, and I think for us, for us, there's there's a visual indicator that that uh you know that says, okay, you know what? They don't look like me. They don't, and they don't look like me. And that's a, it's a reminder for my Lord. These are my kids because I will lay my life down the line for them because I, their kids are kids. And, you know, even with our, our two, the kids, the two boys that we normally bring in the house, um, they're like, it just it just didn't matter because I realized that number one, I was given a responsibility to provide safety to these boys and love to these boys that was taken away from them because you know their parents are just in a different part in their life. And I'm thinking to myself, the audacity, the audacity for me, the audacity, and I'm just gonna speak for me because I can't I don't want to speak for my wife, but the audacity of me to differentiate because now I got really, really, I have three sets. You got the Tarsa boys, I got the, you know, you know, my kids do my DNA. Then I got the other set of kids, the audacity for me to ever separate them in them groups. That that's, that's appalling. Yeah, it is. Naturally. I know, I know that's how it is, but if I'm doing that naturally, I'm going to treat them different if I, you know, kind of put them in a caste system. So what I, what I realize is that, You've been given an opportunity and all you got to really do is think back on your childhood and everything else goes away. 
I don't, you know what? I didn't have a horrible, horrible childhood. No, I didn't have a father. I didn't have good, I didn't have good role models. I didn't see a lot of positivity, but because I didn't see that now, everything, everything that I was, everything that I was thinking of here has went away because I know really at the end of the day, what children need is they need somebody to trust them and love them. So whether they're Hispanic or they're white or they're black or whatever, it doesn't matter to me anymore. And I know my job, my responsibility is to give them the best possible opportunities to be outstanding people, outstanding people, and to truly, truly value people. Because we live in a world right now where people don't value people. They don't value people. They don't really care about other people because it's all about me and getting mine. So I'm, I want to teach these young people that's in this household, number one, let's, let's honor, let's honor, number one, who and what you are trying to be. And if it's confusing and if you don't know, let's, let's call on our father to help us with that. And, and on top of that, let's, let's do what we need to do in the community and help other people out when they can't do anything for us. See, the one thing that I do, um, Car, is I try to help people out knowing that they can't do anything for me. See, if, I, if I'm, if I'm going to help you out and expect for you to help me out later, that's, that's, a, that's a bad deal. See, it's easy for me to do something for you or to borrow you something knowing that you're gonna, you have to give it back later. But when I know if I'm going to give you my time or give you a resource that I know that you can't pay back, that's that's different. So I'm giving out of love. I'm giving out of necessity. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want my kids to do. I want them to be able to pay attention to someone's needs. And one of the things that my my wife always complains about and my kids, I said, why? Every time we every time we every time we go places, you just talk to people all the time. Do you know them? I don't, I don't know. Why do you do that? Well, because you never know. It's you. Some people are one conversation away from committing suicide. They just need to know that you see them and that you care about them. And I treat bums on the street the same way. If I got, if I got it, if I got a dollar, I, I can't do it to everybody. But if I got it, I, I'll probably just, I'll, I'll stop the traffic and go and give it to them. You better my kids, see my kids see that all the time. You know, and they ask, <laughs> why do you do that? And I say, you know, because they're gonna buy some crack with it, Richard. <laughs> they're gonna buy some crack. I say, I say, you know what? You know, I don't know. The beer. <laughs> I, say, I don't know. I say, but at the end of the day, it's not my responsibility on what they do with. I say, I want to, I want to, I want you to demonstrate. I want to demonstrate what it's like to be kind of people. You yeah, know? I understand. I understand that, but I'm not buying no, you know, bum no die because they're gonna that's their crack button right there. Well, the reality is that. Their 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 crack is their crack, but our crack can be sugar. Because think about what sugar is doing to our body. Okay. You know, I to be real. I think about it now. My goodness, I'm 46 years old, and you know, I was just thinking about it. I'm thinking to myself, I work I work my tail off, so just to sometimes look in the mirror and see more tail. <laughs> you know, I was just I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's because sugar is the biggest culprit right now in my in my my overall health. Yeah, I, uh-huh. I work out three four days a week. But my eating habits destroy, yes. destroy what I how I train my body because really crack is that sugar is my crack. Okay, so I can be I can be judgmental and say yeah, but that person actually literally has a, an addiction to a drug. But me, I choose to put you know sugar in my body, knowing at forty six <laughs> it's not going to respond the way it was when I was twenty six, and then I get ticked off and I look in the mirror and be like. Boy, you really are screwing up. So I get it though, but you can't. I, I'm, I'm with you. You. If you giving money to everybody, my goodness, you know more. You're gonna be broken. You're gonna be supporting their habit. But I do it sometimes intentionally so they see what kind of looks like. No, no, I, I I totally get that, and I totally approve of it. I just I just think that <clears throat> in in what we're doing right now, I just think that um, we just have to be more mindful of of how we parent. Yeah, how we you know even if you find yourself being abusive even if we're in a low place as a parent because i've been in low places i've been in situations that i thought there was no return and the way the way i treated my children may have not been the best but if you actively try to fix things yeah if you actively try to 
to get things together because most most times we're in those low things. Like I was in a low place because I lost my father, I lost my job, I lost my car just before I was married. And I had no way of finding a place for me and my kids to live. I had no way of, hold on, hold on. That's somebody. I had no way of providing for them. And that guilt killed my soul because mm-hmm. I was responsible. Even though, you know, these kids were from marriage, I wasn't getting help from either one of my ex-husbands and it was all on me. And it was like no end in sight. And I felt like trash. So maybe took it out on my kids a little bit. Maybe I didn't. It's just, it was, we, we, you, I think we had to accept and realize that our hurt matters too. And mm-hmm. if we're not addressing our hurt, then it's going to spill over to the, to the kids. We're going to oh, be a little does. bit more sharper with our tongues than we should usually be. It always does. You're right. So while while we're on that, because I, you know, I know we know got to probably move on, but so this is so the program. So this is what I want to do. I want to I want to speak to parents. I want to speak to parents or anyone who's actually in relationships with, um, you know, your children or people that you care. So I have a uh, a program, um, and it's all about uh, re- uh, resurrecting relationships in your life, specifically for your children, whether they're young children, middle, you know, teenagers or adult children, because at the end of the day. Um, we live to provide the uh, best possible opportunities for our family, our children. But I know if you have a fractured relationship with your children or even your own family members, for some of us, that's eating us up. But I do I understand that if you want to, if you want to repair it, you have. It's all about you. So um, February fourth, that's going to be on the Thursday. Um, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a four week um, uh, online uh, training on how really to become a person of influence in your own household. And the four components of it is really all about, uh, it's relationships, relationships. See, love and accept yourself. I think for the most part, this is where most people struggle. They don't, they have not learned how to love and accept themselves because the only relationship in your life that is continual and therefore the most important is the one with yourself. And the first person you learn to get along with is yourself. And if you don't get along with yourself, That's where most of your problems are with other people. So I'm going to be talking about relationships, the power of relationship, but the power of relationships with yourself first. And then the second component is called equipping. Equipping, that's, and this is where we have to understand. I think we alluded to this. We're all leaders. You don't have to have a freaking corporate title to be a leader. The fact that you're a parent, you're a leader. See, great leaders grow their vision from me to we. See, people fail to equip others due to the fact that they don't realize that they have the authority or the influence to affect other people. So, so the, the second component of the, uh, what we'll be learning is it's going to be equipping, equipping people, equipping people to go into a, a nourishing relationship with other people. Now, specifically, we're talking about people in your family who need you. And then the third component, we're talking about attitudes. Come on, we all need an attitude adjustment. Our attitude is really a choice because it determines, number one, our approach to life. They can turn our problems into a blessing. Mm. And taking inventory of our attitude allows us to grow and foster the environment to empower and equip people. Think about what I just said. Taking inventory of our attitude allows us to grow and foster the environment. What's the environment? It's the household. If you have fractured relationships with your children, the environment is the household. Guess who created that? You. But you have to take away your pride and say, okay, now how do I fix it? So we're going to be focusing on attitude because attitude is everything. And then the last piece that we're going to focus on is leadership. And it's, it all goes back to leadership. The law of the lead states that leadership ability determines a person's level of effectiveness. That's it. Your level of effectiveness Your level of effectiveness is always demonstrated based on how your children treat each other, how they treat you. It'll tell you if you're doing a good job. And even if you're not doing a good job, you can fix it. See, the law of the law of leadership and the law of process states this leadership takes time and it takes time and energy to develop. So 
we cannot continue to overestimate the event and the circumstances that we create. So I think it's going to be an awesome, awesome um, four weeks together. And I think it's going to be everything that we need as parents to continue to redevelop those relationships with our children, because we can't continue to go year after year saying, well, it's on them. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. That's being selfish because as a parent, I don't care if their children are 30. If the relationship is not right, fix it. So what they're adult, you're their mother and father, fix it. So remember relationships, equipping, the attitude and leadership. We're going to go really, really deep with all four of those lessons. And you're going to be able to hear some pain. You're going to be able to, hopefully, you'll be able to hear some things that you have done that you need to fix. And I tell you what, if, if given the opportunity for you to be part of this amazing group, uh, I hope that when it's all said and done, you'll come out and be like, ah, so the onus is on me. These are the things that I need to do. And don't expect, don't expect your child to just, de- depending on how far this relationship is fractured, don't, just, don't expect your child your middle, your teenager, your semi, a young adult, your 30, 40 year old. Don't expect for them to jump on board right away because every we all need time. We all need time to win back those relationships. But I promise you, these are four amazing lessons that um, I learned, you know, um, working with some amazing leaders. And it's true. We, we need to really develop these four things. So that'll be February 4th. That's on the Thursday. Oh, so I, can't, okay. I can't wait for it because I'm, yeah, you know, yeah, starting. One, Go ahead. And one, one question. Um, um, so one, one person, um, Jennifer wanted to talk about the, um, what is it called? I just had this word in my head. Um, um, neurotic um, personality disorder with certain parents and how um, it can become a, it, it can become abusive. Ibrahim, I'm a punch in your face. But go ahead. All right. <laughs> Uh, you said a, new, a neurotic what now? A neurotic personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> neurotic personality disorder with, with, with parents and how it later on um, becomes abuse from the parent. Like, you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah, that, 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 deep. That, that describes <laughs> that describes half the people in my family. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh um, it, it's, it's, it's personality driven. Um, it's, but it, when you think about being neurotic, you know, that's really taken on a great deal of responsibility. It's taken on a great deal of responsibility. <laughs> Wait, neurotic or narcissistic is narcissistic. Oh, narcissistic. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know that we, we struggle right that now. And we're struggling right now with a, one of our kids in our house. Uh, and that's, that's the attitude of just simply believing that you're better just for no other reason than, you know, we got a kid right now who's, you know, he's a young guy, but he's so smart. Like he's a smart guy, but he shows very little compassion to the other siblings in the house. He's always looking for an opportunity to be on top of them, to make them feel like crap. And this is what we just talked about earlier. If you remember, we got a lot of smart people and, you know, just making policies in this country. But what they lack is they lack that moral compass to lead to lead with their heart. Mm. That narcissistic is very that's destroying the that's destroying the, the fiber of our democracy because people are just doing their job and they're very very smart and brilliant people. But I, uh, their 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 brilliance is um, dominant, and the 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 moral compass is you know somewhere down here. So they, 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 they yield to their job title and just being smart and getting over on other people. And mm-hmm. that's sick. That's a sickness because it's not about other, even though you think about it, politics, supposedly it's about the welfare for other people, right? Depending on how you see Democrat and Republican or whatever, but it's really about other people, right? Supposed to be. But why do we have policies? Why do we have a, a government or policy that does the opposite. These are very, very smart and brilliant people, but they oftentimes they they serve they serve their their ability to be smart and and when it comes to their moral compass and just being able to have a heartbeat, that's where they fail. So narcissistic behavior 
Um, unfortunately, I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's 13. Where is he learning that from? Because it definitely doesn't, it doesn't, we don't do that in our household. Um, I don't know what goes on in the other household, but his dad, his dad is pretty awesome. God, he's a school teacher. Like, I don't know. So I'm not really sure where that's coming from, but it's honestly dealing with stepkids. Sometimes they mom be like, um, uh, don't be like them other kids in the house. They be like on a low, like. I believe that's a conversation that's probably being had in the other household because we and, um, do have a lot of different kids in this household. You know, so that kids. might, you know, it is being. You know, it's got to be taught, and I don't you know, know. You know, those kids is not do, is not the best at this, and you know that you better than them. You, my baby. <laughs> I know. I'm just. <clears throat> no, I'm thinking about that. I, I'm, I'm I'm thinking, you know, you never know what's going on. I know that kind of stuff all the time. Like I had to. We had to assess, um, we had to teach my, my stepson how to, how to uh, acclimate himself because it's like a, it was a tribal thing with, um, because his, um, he is from, a, his parents are from, a, his, his mother is from a different country. And when he came here, it was like, our, my kids are African-American. This was like years ago because we, mm-hmm. we got them, we fixed them. So my kids are African-American. So a lot of other people from different places don't necessarily like African-Americans. Right. So it was um, it was assumed that my kids are bad because they're African-American. They're this, they're that. You know, so I'll use them. You know, they're not bad. Yeah, right. And we had to adjust it in our own household. So we had to fix what was taught over there and let him know, boo-boo kitty, uh-uh. I don't care what nobody else teaching you. Uh, this is the situation. Mm. So now he's accommodated. He may still, they may still teach him that. I don't care. As long as he know that this African-American mom don't play no games with him. Right, right. So, and that's the importance of you. But you still you gotta there. love them. When you love right. them and when you care about them and you nurture them, they, the stepkids, they love you to the point that like, they don't care what their, you know, their mom say. They, right. they know they have to act. It's like they have two minds. They have to act a certain way from the, their mom and then they can be their their true self when they finally come to you like oh finally i can be myself <laughs> so that's how it is now yeah and it's like when you got two kids you got kids going from household to household it's just two sets of rules and one thing that we we, we really try to listen you know and kids this is very difficult but hey whatever we're doing here we we would prefer that you don't you know put it on full blast over there. Like we don't, we don't even yeah. know what's going on like, in our house. It was yeah. like to the point that I had spies in my house. When, when I, me and my first, my husband first got married, it was like to the point that I had spies in my house and it was like nerve wracking to me. And I'm mm-hmm. like, it's, but they didn't know better because right, they didn't know better. They, they wanted to be pleasing to their mom. It was like, okay, I got to be pleasing to my mom. She want to know. So I'm going to give her all the tea. I'm going to give her all the tea. Mm-hmm. So, they they gave her what their mom wanted because they wanted to make their mom happy because yeah. they would oh I'm getting attention oh if I tell her this she gonna listen finally so I'm gonna give her this attention I'm gonna let her know everything mm-hmm. that she said everything that she did and I'm gonna make sure that you know it starts all the but they don't know they don't know. they don't get it and oftentimes the other parent can use it use their children almost like an esp- esp- espionage and you know. Let me know what's going on. And it's, you know, they don't know. They don't know. And it's just, it stinks because when you're, whenever it's going on in your house is now being, you know, translated and other people know, mm-hmm. but the kids never really tell the story the way it is, you know, because they only see it from one perspective. They, you know, they're down here. We're up here. So their story is from this, from a perspective from here to here. So they, when they go to the other house, they tell that story from this perspective. And it's funny when you get a phone call or a text message, you know, and they're uh, yes. asking, you, asking you or challenging something that went on in your house. And, you know, naturally, we're like, what? <laughs> you know? but that, was like, a mistake. that was a mistake that I made. Like, we got a, a comment. Jennifer said that she doesn't even call her step her stepdaughter. Her step, she just calls her a bonus child. But that was like something that we had to deal with and we had to adjust. So it was like, um, you know, we... we have to love our we had to love them. Wait, I'm confused. What, what, was, I, what was I just saying? No, you were just talking about the reality of how you know information is being exchanged. Oh yeah, the it's going to happen because the yeah. is with the jealous mom, is with the jealous dad, all this other stuff. Is 
it is what it is. But I want information. You as soon as you just establish a relationship, it's, it's harder first. But when you establish a relationship with the child, I date all of my kids. So we go out on dates, individual dates, because they all need mommy time. That's right. When That's they are right. in my house, they are my kids. That's right. And you know, one mistake I feel like I made is when they moms, because the the moms would do something real ignorant, and then you still had to swallow it a little yeah. bit, and then I'd be like, you know what? <laughs> and then I would go like and complain about it instead of just dealing with it internally. And I would be, and then if they hurt, they still their mom. So that's right. Still, that's right. You still gotta like deal with it, and you can't, you know. But they would say something. You, I gotta defend my mom because you can't be saying that. That was one mistake. Because I would be in my room and be like, "Uh, uh-uh, I'm so tired of this." Any other instead of just me being patient and understanding that this is just a test and we just had to deal with it, I would complain about it instead of going to my lord with it. I would complain about it. We're not given anything we can bear. So understanding all of that, I should have dealt with it a bit better. Even though it was a, it was a trial for me. It was, it was like to the point that I couldn't even breathe. And it's very dangerous. You think about that. You know, you think about that. There is nothing like the love of a, uh, a kid for their mom and a mom for their kid. And even if their mom is making poor, like with my, my foster boys, these their parents are drug addicts. Mm-hmm. You know, but. And oftentimes, you know, I'm my wife get a little frustrated because they do make in some of the same. But I, I always say, listen, man, you know, I'm. I'm I'm not trying to replace your mom, your dad said, but I'm your, I'm your father while you're in this house. And I was like, your mom just right now, she's just in a really bad place where she's making really poor decisions. But I was like, good Lord, I make, I make poor decisions. I said, she's just making poor decisions that is, has affected you and your brothers. Like, so that doesn't make her a bad person. Mm-hmm. Like, she just need help. I was like, it's like when you get sick with the flu, no one, you know, as a parent, we're not going to just say all oh, you know, when you sick, you need love. You need to be nurtured back to health. And I was like, your mom has chosen to, you know, you know, she's made some bad decisions, you know, and, you know, this particular uh, item has ch- claimed her life right now, but she will get better. I don't know what time. That, I don't know when that's going to be, but just in this time frame, you're going to probably experience a lot of pain. Yeah, when she comes back, just have it have be open arm. You have a you have a mother and a father, and that's what I talk to my kids about too. Because if their their dads are not necessarily in their lives, I'm like they're not in your lives for a reason at this point right now. Right, but right now you have replacement. You have right. you know you have a mother, you have a father, you have someone that is in your life that is um, accommodating that God gave you and accommodating you with that might be better at this point in time, and um. You have that. So when they are ready to come back, let them come back with open arms. That's right. Don't be mad at them. Be like, all right, well, you know, you're here now. So let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. So well, it's good. I think you did it. I think you're doing a good job. Uh, but yes, uh, what a great session. Um, so, yeah, that'll be January. Um, no, February. February 4th. 4th. Like I said, my kids, all four of my boys are in his program. They are loving it. Um, they're doing group session right now, so they're talking to other kids who are kids, that's right. doing doing the same. They're going through the same motions as them who are trying to find leadership skills. So if you guys are looking for group sessions, looking for individual sessions, I will recommend it because it, it helped my nineteen year my my eighteen year old. He is he was a little lost and it's helping him. Okay, focus. Where are my priorities? You don't have to be your only child's teacher. You do not have to be the only person that's teaching your child. You might need some outside help. But make sure the outside help makes sense. Yeah. So talk to somebody that makes it. Talk to Richard. I'm going to have this information down on the um in the screen below. So also like, subscribe, and share this video. Um, I'm trying to change. We're trying to make some change in our community. Let's do it. Interesting. Um, uh, she's the only one to call me Richard. Like that, that sounds like I'm getting in trouble. Uh, when we become when we become really good friends, she's going to call me Rich. So when she calls me Richard, I just could just hear my mom. Like my mom, that's my mom right there in that picture. <laughs> just like I'm, she said, Richard. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So whenever we become really good friends, this, uh, the car will start calling me Rich. So um, okay, it'd be really uncomfortable calling me Richard. You know, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> like I know I'm in trouble when I hear Richard. <laughs> all right, you guys. Um, it was only speak. All right. All right. Take care. <laughs> Oh, my God.